So again, what is the 28 digit sequence and then how did you remember it or how could you have remembered? We'll just take another couple of minutes and then I'll, I'll collect them and we'll talk about it. You guys can try and get uh, try and get it down real quick if you can and collect in about two minutes. Can run it down that uh, and find your name. Most of you look closer to the other in a minute or so, and then I'll grab them from you. All right, if you want to go ahead and pass those up to me, I will uh, 
How can we take them from you? All right, here we go. So how many of you by show of hands, and I could see them kind of on here, but how many of you by show of hands uh, remembered it correctly? All 28 digits. Uh oh, you're like 21? Oh, close, right. All right, a lot of you. So again, this is ridiculous, right? Like when in real life are you ever gonna need to do this? Probably not. But if you can hold on to this because you were motivated, can you imagine what else you could hold on to, right? It's just kind of a, Fun to think that you could have this. And I'm so sorry, again, if this is in your brain for way longer than it needs to be. I don't know if I'll ever forget this. And it's such random, useless information, right? But what did you do to hold on to it? Anyone willing to uh, share? If you came up with a story, what was it? Or, or how did you do it? Yeah. Angel's eyes. Uh, I remember the one from the police department. Third Street, World War II, DC Comics twice. 13 soldiers and then lift 26 and then all with a Z. Okay, all right, right. So a little bit of chunking plus making a few things like little meaningful sections. But there's definitely a few things in there you can kind of make into like a word or a phrase. Anybody, anybody else? Yeah, and then I'll come over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. And sometimes like giving it a beat or yeah. um, even like if there's a song that like, you know, sometimes for whatever reason that might make it easier. Right. So that's great that you found a strategy that worked. Anybody, anybody else, anyone come up with a story that you uh, are willing to, to share? Did anyone make a story like, like mine? I, I inevitably get like million people died or more part police department. Those are like the NPD all the time, but oh. any, any stories? I mean, I get to read them all, but anyone want to? Share is that almost again? Well, no, I was just gonna say that's kind of weird that like so many people thought of many people died. I know. If you look at that, it's not really the first thing you think of, right? Most people do more part police department or something to that like extent just because of where we are. But then because my story was really people died, like sometimes that tricks with people. Um, well, I will look forward to uh to reading what you did, and I, I promise you won't see this again. Um so you can let it go from your mind if you would like to, or you can hold on to it forever. That's totally up to you. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll keep going with um, the rest of the chapter on memory. And then at the end today, um, I will talk a little bit about our second exam, which is on Wednesday, right? Wow, we won't be meeting in person. It's on the, on the syllabus. So hopefully uh, that's not sneaking up on you. 
But um, we'll talk about that at the end. Don't let me don't let me forget in the spirit of forgetting that we'll talk about today. Don't let me forget. Uh, but let's go back and talk about some of the reasons why we don't hold on to information as long as we uh, or as long as we might want to hold on to it. So let me go back here. I feel like this is me a lot. You know, I don't know if any of you have this moment too, but uh, I will. Uh, I will go downstairs to my office and walk into my office and be like, what it, why am I here? What did I forget? And then I have to come back upstairs to remember and then back downstairs and now I've exercised and I'm bitter about it, right? Uh, but I have this moment a lot, like if I'm not paying attention or if I have too many things going on, there's a lot of reasons why we forget, right? Forgetting is just a natural thing that happens. Sometimes it's super frustrating, but it does happen to us a lot. So we'll look at some of the uh, biological factors which are reasons why we forget. And then some of the more like experience related ones that explain why we don't remember everything. And uh, there are an incredible number of movies. There are even more than this, but I put some of the big ones up here. Lots of movies related to memory loss. And some of them are better than others or more accurate than others, I should say. Uh, like the, the notebook is all about Alzheimer's, which is definitely a type of memory loss. We talked a little bit about that last time. Uh, Finding Nemo. Right, we'll watch a little clip from that in a second. Probably one of the best like poor memory characters um, ever. Um, some of them with memory manipulation or memory due to like trauma. Uh, this one, entertaining but completely made up. Right, the idea that you would forget every night when you go to sleep, totally made up. Uh, but it's kind of a fun, uh, creative movie at least. There is a character in there if you've ever seen this though, uh, 10 Second Tom, if you've watched this movie. Uh, who can't remember past like five to 10 seconds, he's actually more realistic than the main character, Drew Barrymore's uh, memory loss. But there's lots and lots of different movies about this, a really um, kind of fun and interesting thing to portray in the movies. Um, and I couldn't not show you like a clip of, of Dory, right? Because it feels like she's just like the best memory character maybe um, ever. So I'll play a little clip for you and then we can talk about it. What was that? I know, right? The happiest and also like that she suffers from short-term memory loss. I'm not sure that I would agree with that, right? I, I almost just feel like it would be more accurate to say that she has a poor memory, right? Because there are points in the movies, in both of them, right, where she's motivated to remember something and she does, right? So she doesn't have great memory, right? But I'm not sure I'd say short-term memory loss because uh, what is it, the, the P. Sherman... 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney, right? Like she can remember that, like she repeats it over and over and over again. Uh, so there are moments where she remembers and moments where she doesn't, but probably one of the best like memory related characters uh, that we could talk about, right? But there's tons and tons of these movies, different um, kind of a different focus for each one, but they all highlight this topic of memory loss, which again is something that we all experience, but to, <laughs> to different degrees. And it can be from, uh, you know, something biological, like an accident or just time, or it could be more experience related, like you weren't paying uh, attention in the first place. So uh, the number one reason that we forget, bottom line, whether regardless of all of the factors that we're going to talk about, is just time. Time passes and we forget, right? It's called the decay theory, right? As time passes, information that we're not using falls away, it decays from our mind, and we just don't hold on to it anymore. Right, uh, because of the passage of time. It's really just the number one reason that we forget. And I want to give you an example of this. So um, I need you to uh, have like a scratch piece of paper. You're not turning it in. You could just flip over over like what whatever you're writing on, or it could be uh, if you're typing, that's fine. Just make sure you can't see your notes from last class. So last class, I read you two lists of words. Not the sleep list, that would be too easy, but the other, the other list of 16 random words that I read to you last class. No. <laughs> no. Um, I want you to think back, write down as many of them, if any, and if you can't remember any of them, that's okay. It was meaningless, random words. I want you to write down as many of the words from last class as you can remember. Not the sleep list, but the other 16 random words. Some of you are glaring at me, right? I, it's not doesn't count for anything, but just write down any of them that you can remember. Yeah. 16 yeah. There were 
There were. I'll put them up for you in a moment to remind you. But uh, if you can remember any of them, write them down. I'll give you about a minute or so. I'll stop talking so you can focus. But try and think if you can remember any of them. So yeah, this looks like you give me an hour. It's not gonna matter, right? I'll give you a few more seconds though. Hold on. Okay, I'm gonna put up the list from last time and let's see, uh, let's see how we did. Let's see if anybody um, has any of them or how many we have. Uh, this is the list of those random 16 words that I read to you, right? Oh, you're like, all oh, those, right? <laughs> uh, how many of you, by show of hands, got at least two of them? Raise your hand, okay? Keep your hand up if it still applies. Three or more? Four or more? Five or more? I lost a few. How many did you get? Five. Five, did anyone get more than five? Right, so five. And that's impressive, right? These were random. I promise you, you'll never see these again. I won't ask you like again two weeks from now. Uh, but last time we got 10 of them, right? The, a couple of you got 10 of them. A lot of you got like seven, eight or nine of them. But because time has passed, these were meaningless and we didn't use them in any way, right? They fell off of your mind. Five of them, we had one person get five. A few of you got like four. A couple got three and a couple got two. Right? And that just happens if you're not using something and it's not relevant in some way, it's gonna fall off. It's just gonna decay away from, uh, from your memory. So that's the number one reason that we forget, just time and we're not using it. Another big biological reason that can happen is there's some kind of disruption in the storage process. Think about this like you haven't saved a document on a computer, and if your computer crashes, you're gonna lose information up to the last like save or restore point, right? Your mind is the same way. We can have things happen where people have head injuries or some kind of brain damage or brain trauma. Uh, retrograde amnesia, which can happen for some kind of a traumatic event that occurs to you. There's also different types of uh, dissociative amnesia where people forget due to like psychological traumas that happen. But if people have trauma to the head or trauma to the brain, it can cause them to forget. Right? And what's so unique about this is depending on the type of trauma to the head, uh, different types of memory loss occur, right? And we don't have like one standard type of memory loss because different parts of the brain are in charge of different parts of memory. So depending on what part you harm, it might affect what you um, remember or don't remember. Uh, not my favorite movie at all, but I was dragged to it years and years ago. And if any of you saw The Vow, right, the older movie, I was dragged to it, but there was lots of popcorn, so it was fine with me. Uh, the main character goes through a windshield of a car right, and forgets like the last like five or six years of her life in which that time she had actually met someone, fallen in love with them and, and so on. That could actually happen. It's based on a true story, actually. Um, and the main, the person that it's based on went through a car window um, in an accident, lost memory for 18 months of her life, which in that time she had married her husband, met him and married him. She had no memory of him whatsoever, like from that 18 months. And really, really kind of like romantic, right? He was able to make her fall back in love with him and they got remarried, which is, you know, the sappy outcome that you would hope for. But uh, she had no memory of him whatsoever, right? And that's really, really rare. Oftentimes people's memory will come back when they have memory loss. Um, hers never did, but her name was Cricket. I remember Cricket with a K because it was memorable. But uh, stuff like that happens and you see it in movies all the time. People hit their head and they have memory loss. Usually it starts to come back, but in rare cases, it can uh, never come back. So head injuries, brain damage, uh, any kind of like trauma, psychological or physical, there are different um, conditions like Alzheimer's that we talked about last time that can also cause memory loss. Lots and lots of reasons that people forget. And all of these are kind of a more biological ones. Yeah.
So all this is the paper beam. So if you think of uh, dementia as an umbrella, there's a Lewy body dementia, all, all kinds of dementia, vascular dementia. So it's a type of dementia. Oh, what was that? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. It's named after the, the doctor, um, Alois Alzheimer, and then he was like founder of the clinical uh, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Any other questions or thoughts or comments or anything for, for now before we keep going? But, uh, so biology plays a role, but experiences do as well. Uh, if you haven't had this wonderfully fun experience, you will at some point. Uh, I'm sure most of you have had to study for more than one exam at a time, right? Like finals week where you're studying for three or four tests at the same time. Sometimes when that happens, we can experience something called interference, where information gets like mixed up or jumbled or pushed aside by other information, right? So uh, what happens with this is something that's new might interfere with something that you already knew. Or something that you, uh, something that's old interferes with your ability to learn something new, right? Really, really common that this kind of stuff happens, that information just gets kind of jumbled up. So let's say with retroactive interference, new learning interferes with old information, right? So let's say you're studying economics and you're studying psychology, you go to take your economics test, and that psychology stuff that you just were studying interferes with your remembering of, of the other stuff that you were like working on. It all gets kind of jumbled and mixed up together. This is really, really common. Uh, kind of a funny, um, funny thing. You know the the A B C D E F U song, right? Like that's all so popular right on TikTok and everything. It's making it where sometimes people have a hard time remembering the alphabet, right? Or singing the alphabet in the old way. They start singing it in this like new song way. I've seen it over and over and over again. It's kind of funny to watch people do this. My kids, my seven year old kids, are singing it. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't know what you're saying. Don't, don't sing it that way. You got to sing the alphabet the old way. But uh, that's an example of interference, right? This new song, right? That has like a different, um, a different cadence, different words, different tone, right? Is interfering with the way that they used to remember how to sing the alphabet. They're seeing that uh, interestingly a lot. Right now. Yeah. So would something like that be caused because of like maybe the new information that you're attaining is either more important or because it's newer information? It's maybe because it's it might be more important, but it's usually just because it's more immediate, right? Like you're you're focusing on it right now, and so it makes it hard to remember something that you had before, right? So maybe you're taking French right now, and you've always spoken, you know how to speak Spanish, and all of a sudden you can't remember how to speak Spanish because you're focusing on French. Um, so it's more that it's just more maybe relevant in the moment um, than the old information. And then we can obviously have the opposite: proactive interference is when old learning interferes with new information. I have this problem all the time when it comes to parking. Like if you ever see me out in the world wandering a parking lot, feel bad for me. I'm, I'm trying to find my car, right? This happens to me all the time. It happened to me once at Disneyland. I was wandering the Mickey and Friends parking structure for like an hour, hitting the button on my car, hoping I could hear it. I could hear it, but where it was, I had no idea, right? It was so, so awful because it's such a massive structure. Just wandering for an hour, like, and I was tired because we had spent the whole day at the park. But I couldn't remember where I parked my car because I was thinking where I parked it last time. I don't know why I remembered where I parked it like a year prior, but not that day. Um, this kind of stuff happens all, all the time where old learning interferes with new stuff or new stuff interferes with old stuff. It just kind of gets jumbled in your head and it makes it difficult to remember. So interference is a big one. Uh, so are situational factors. Right? And we've, uh, I mentioned this last time and a couple of you asked about it. There's something called state-dependent memory. When you learn something in one physiological state, you're actually more likely to remember it when you're in that same state again. Now, there's also something called context-dependent memory, which we can talk about as well. But this typically refers to like a physiological state. So in theory, and I'm, I'm definitely not recommending this for your exam, but in theory, if you learned information when you were drunk, you would remember that information better when you were drunk again, right? This stuff happens all the time, right? So again, I'm not saying that like, you should do that for the test. When you're drinking, it impairs your memory, period. But they do this sometimes with trauma, right? Well, like when somebody's trying to recall something traumatic, if it happened at night, we might try to recreate the situation that it happened in to bring it back. 
You have memory loss of something that happened when, um, when you were on a substance. If you were on that substance, you might recall it again. Or in that like environment, you might recall it again. It's a very like uh, common thing that we see. It's not an incredible difference, but it's just enough that it might be helpful. And then the variation of this is context dependent memory, which we were talking about, like you sit in your same spots every time, recreating the lighting. Uh, if you uh, studied for an exam chewing gum, you want to chew uh, the same type of gum, not the same piece, but the same type of gum uh, during the exam. Right? If you study drinking coffee, drink coffee when you take the test. Right? If you study listening to music like we talked about, you listen to music during the exam. All those little cues can help you to remember a little bit better. Right? So we have state dependent, which is more like the physiological state. And then context is recreating the cues in the environment, which might help you to coming up in your dreams because it's like an ongoing issue that might be like symbolically hidden in some way. Like if you have reoccurring dreams, it's like some reoccurring issue in your life. Uh, but other people might say that it has nothing to do with this. Right? So it kind of depends which perspective you embrace. Uh, but maybe there are some elements of this, right? The, the context of the place and it keeps reoccurring for you. And it might be true that you forget a dream that you had last night, but then something happens that reminds you of the dream. And then it starts to come back through. Uh, dreams are, are fascinating, right? I, I love dreams. But uh, it could be a little bit of, of a bunch of different things. Yeah. What is Like, is it under that category? Yeah, it's, um, we'll talk about it. It's actually one of the slides that we have coming up, right? Any other questions for now? So, again, I'm, I'm in no way recommending that you like drink and study and then drink and take the test, right? But in theory, in theory, hypothetically, right? Well, I ruined your weekend. Um, room to, room to Wednesday. Uh, but in theory, right, if you were in one state, so let's say you're drinking caffeine, right, you study drinking uh, coffee, right, you have the coffee drink right here, right, you should have the same type of drink or you are a monster or whatever it is, have the same type of drink when you take the exam, and that might bring it back just a little bit, a little bit better. Yeah. One of them was situational, like, the other one was, um, so state dependent, um, think about like the physiological state that you need. So whether you're really like um, alert or aroused from the substance, or if you're um, heightened, what way aroused or alertness. The other one is more like the context around it. So sitting in the same chair, same lighting, right on the feet. So it might, uh, might slightly bring that back. And you can kind of combine them together. What's the name of the one? Context dependent. The context around you is now. Um, some special topics in memory. Uh, think about this sometime later today. You don't have to do it right now because it's kind of a, it can take some time to do. But if you spend some time later today trying to think back to your earliest memory, right? <laughs> that's like the third no from you today. <laughs> right? If you try to think back to your earliest memory, Like three, maybe even four. Very, very common that most of us cannot remember at all before the age of two. And childhood amnesia is this inability to remember back from like when you're very, very, very little. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that our brain isn't nearly um, close to being fully developed yet. Language and memory are very connected, and we have very little language at two. Right. So if we're not able to like identify and make it meaningful, it's hard to remember it. Now, that doesn't mean that things that happened to us before two aren't incredibly important. It just means you might not remember them. Unless something really like traumatic or something really, really memorable happened, in that case, you might hold on to it. 
But unless that's the case, you probably won't remember before the age of two. So if someone's like, I remember being born, probably not, right? Yeah. Yeah, but see, that's traumatic, right? Like as a two-year-old, like that is, that is memorable, right? So in a case like that, you might remember it, but you might not remember it accurately. Our memories are almost never 100% accurate, which we'll talk a little bit more in the coming slides. But if it happened, something like that, that would be memorable, right? Um, I got bit by a dog when I was uh, just before my second birthday. All right. I got bit really badly by our family dog. I had like multiple stitches. I was in the hospital. I remember none of that. The only thing I remember, and I think this is just so typical of me, is that it happened on my mom's birthday and I got the biggest piece of cake because they felt bad for me. I don't remember being bit. I don't remember the stitches. I don't remember the hospital, but I remember the cake. Memorable, right? Apparently the cake was the most memorable part, but it's so common when things happen really young to us. Um, we might remember that, but we don't remember the like typical stuff, even before maybe like three or four. It's just it's, one, it's far away, and two, there's a lot of factors working in the brain. So you said our memory isn't always accurate to what we went through. Um, does that mean that our brain may take information from different times and replace it with? You can. It's called a um, source error, which we'll talk about. I think it's on the, the next um, slide or, or a slide or two away. So that can be part of it, right? That we um, that we like mix memories up or mix up like things that happen in one time versus another time. Another could be that we we tend to pay attention only to certain elements, right? So you might remember some parts of an event, but not not all of it. Or you remember it from your perspective, and somebody else will remember it from theirs, and they might be a little bit different. They can totally, that happens a lot. Uh, extraordinary memory. Anyone in here feel like you have a really, really good memory? Just by show of hands, like you have a really, really strong memory. I wish I did. I don't, right? And nobody really raised their hand. Yeah. It's like a picture memory. Yeah, photographic. Like, mm -hmm. like it's like you're not anymore, but. And it's actually really common that that fades. Um, sometimes people people are more likely to have that when they're younger than they are when they're when they're older. Uh, but that's called eidetic memory or photographic memory is the common name, but eidetic is the formal one. There are some people who can do that, right? Who can almost remember things like they've taken a mental picture of it in their head. It's not perfect, but it um, it is something that some people do possess. We don't know why some people possess it over others. I wrote a little bit more about it in like the textbook. But uh, there are some people who have very extraordinary memories or can remember things with like a, almost like a savant level um, of remembering. This one's much more common though. Flashbulb memories um, are things that we all possess. Things that happened in your life that were like very vivid or may maybe really memorable. It might be something that you can see almost like you were watching a movie of it for years and years and years. And then this can be something good or something bad. Um, oftentimes like cultural events are very much this way, like remembering where you were, uh, you know, when 9-11 happened or remembering where you were when like uh, with COVID, right? It could be something that was like a big cultural event, but um, maybe it's a, a wedding, right? Or it's a traumatic event that happened in your life. We often can remember things very vividly, even years and years and years later, though it doesn't again always mean that we remember it accurately. Accurately and vividly aren't always the, the same thing. Uh, source error, which we just you had asked you a few minutes ago about this. This is a, a really common thing that happens. Think about that. Um, hold on one second. Well, think about that list that I, I shared with you with the, the sleep words. A lot of you remembered the word sleep, even though it wasn't one of the words, right? That, that's an example of source error where we kind of uh, mess up the memory. We maybe we confuse it with other memories. Really, really common. And it relates to eyewitness testimony which I'll talk more about, but did you have a, a question? What's up? Yeah, so, uh, do with, uh, memory? Sure. So does weed really affect your short-term memory more than your long-term? Mm -hmm. And does it damage you? It can, right? So people who smoke a lot of pot or ingest a lot of pot or eat a lot of it, whatever it might be, uh, marijuana does tend to affect your short-term memory. Now, it might not if you're using it like sporadically or every now and then, but people who use it I was going to say chronically, but that might be a kind of funny pun. Um, people are using it all the time. 
uh, tend to have their memory start to be affected. Memory and motivation are very common uh, things that are affected by like heavy marijuana use. So uh, what it does is it affects your hippocampus. And so it starts to affect some of your short-term memory, but not necessarily your long-term memory. It, it hasn't really been shown to generalize to that, but more like little short-term things that might be affected by it, um, especially if you're using it a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it affects your TH receptors in your brain, right? And so it's thought to like affect the hippocampus in a way where it just, it impairs your ability to attentively like pay attention to the things around you. Now, again, in theory, if you were in a state, like if you learned something or had something happened to you while you were, uh, when you were high on like marijuana, if you were high on it again, you would remember it better. Again, I'm not recommending that. <laughs> I'd like to have to like put that afterwards, right? Uh, but it does tend to affect the way that your short term memory stores information and your attention because your attention is very impaired. It's altered. So you're not paying the same amount of attention as you would um, if you were in like, a completely lucid state. And so that's thought to be part of it. But it also affects that hippocampus like, quite heavily. Um, and so we're doing it repeatedly can start to affect your short term memory a little bit. I had a friend that was married with something with other kids. When yeah. she wasn't high, she would be very. Um, anxiety, very, sure. she couldn't focus, and so she would go and smoke, and then she'll come back, and then she was very calm, and very like normal. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people can develop a, a crutch with any substance, right? And uh, this last two years, a lot of people have developed like substance abuse issues, whether it's a uh, you know using something to help them sleep or drinking to help them like get through this anxiety and stress. It's been really, really prevalent these last two years with all the anxiety and stress we've experienced. Uh, but that happens. People start using it. It makes them feel better. And so they keep using it and they have to have it in order to be okay. Uh, that happens That happens to people a lot. So Elizabeth Loftus, very famous uh, memory researcher, spent a lot of time talking about um, how inaccurate eyewitness testimony is. And I was trying to find like a fun um, clip of this and um, I was struggling to find one that I liked, but I have a, a video I'll show you in a moment. But uh, with eyewitness testimony, it's very easy to skew somebody's memory. And we get that source error. We can kind of mess up what they remember versus what we're telling them they remember. And a lot of this is shaped by how you ask questions. So Elizabeth Loftus would show this video of like two cars getting into a traffic accident. And then she would ask slightly different questions. And the ways uh, that the questions were asked would influence memory. About how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? about how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. Just changing like hit versus smashed into led to a statistically significant difference in how much glass people remembered. Um, if, was there broken glass in the incident or not? Um, if you ask somebody like, what was the person wearing versus what color t-shirt were they wearing, right? Like you're guiding one in a way um, versus the other is a little more neutral. We can very easily shape somebody's memory um, and, and it gets confused a lot with things that happened versus things that didn't happen, or things that happen in one memory versus things that might have happened in a different. And I have an example of this. It's kind of a, it's on the older side, but I think it's such a great example. And you can, uh, you can laugh at some of the items in the picnic that are, that are old. But um, there's this little memory, and you'll see that sleep list that I read to you. Um, it's actually on here as well. Um, and you can see the first word that he says is sleep when he's trying to remember it, that I, that I played for read to you um, last week, but uh, you can see how right, like looking at the pictures caused him to remember things that weren't there. That's a great example of source error, right? Where he's kind of jumbling what happened with um, the pictures and what he remembers and what he doesn't. We do this a lot, especially with memories of like childhood. Sometimes you might think you remember something from childhood, but are you remembering the event or are you remembering like a picture of it or a video of it? or somebody's retelling or a story of it. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to know. It might be kind of a combination of all of those, but our eyewitness testimony tends to be pretty poor, which is why it, is, it doesn't stand up on its own um, in court, because we can easily manipulate somebody's memory in the way that we ask questions. And everybody tends to focus on different things and give it its, um, their own meaning. And so it can be very um, unreliable. And so oftentimes we remember things very differently than other people, depending on our own experiences and what we decided to pay attention to. A uh, couple last uh, thoughts here. 
you know, you asked about deja vu earlier, right, uh, deja vu. Uh, another kind of interesting memory thing that happens to us, I'm sure you've all experienced deja vu, right, that weird moment of like, I know I've experienced this before, this has happened before. I had a student once who was like, I know everything you're going to say because it's like it's happened already. I'm like, uh, <laughs> we tested it and it, it didn't hold up, but it was kind of funny anyway for a moment. She's like, I know what you're going to say next. And she didn't, she guessed Kate, you know, it was like, it was a good guess, but uh, but very common that we have these moments, right? Like, and you can't explain them. We don't have a good satisfactory explanation for them, which is kind of disappointing, right? Um, our best explanation that we have is something about the current situation, the current events that are happening triggers like a shadow of a memory, shadow of a memory from something that already happened, right? But that's super unsatisfying when you have a moment of deja vu and it has that weird kind of eerie feeling to it. I mean, people hypothesize like it happened in a previous life or you dreamt about it, um, that it's some kind of like ESP kind of ability. But in general, it's just thought that something from the situation right now that you have that ES, uh, that deja vu in reminds you of something else that happened that was very similar. Right? Again, super unsatisfying, but it's kind of the best explanation that we have. And it's something that we all experience. Maybe something is familiar enough or you dreamt about it or you were thinking about it. Um, and then something reminds you of that situation. Yeah. And then how do you explain that? Right. Or you reach for the phone and it rings, right? Like there's so many weird little eerie things that happen to us in life that we can't explain, right? You, you think of, you're thinking about somebody and something happens to them, right? Was that just coincidence or was it something more? I mean, we don't really have an answer for that. Scientifically, we would give it some explanation like this one, but you know, in a practical sense, we want more, right? That it's not unsatisfying, but we don't really have a better explanation as of right now, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're a creature of habit, right? If you have the same routine every day, it makes sense that you would have some like deja vu a little bit like with it. It could, or like the days start to blur a little bit, right? Like uh, you have the same routine that you follow every time in the shower, but you're like, did I wash my hair yet or not? Like, cause you do it so automatically, you might not remember, you know? And some of that is deja vu and some of it's just like, you know, a blending of, um, you do it so repeatedly that they all kind of uh, blend together in a way. But yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's unsatisfying, but that's a uh, kind of the best that we, that we have. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or um, a lot of people have those like medicine containers with the days of the week, and so if the day is empty, then you know to do it, assuming that you fill it every week, otherwise. You know, it doesn't help. But yeah, doing something random each day, like, like if you can remember that, like, oh yeah, I touched my ear after this, or I did this afterwards, then that might help you to keep it straight for sure. Yeah. Does Asia coincide with like superstition and how they start? Uh, I mean, it's kind of in that realm of like magical thinking and ESP like abilities, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to. Right? It's more like that feeling like you've experienced it before versus. Uh, superstitious thinking is more like if I don't do this something bad will happen so like if I don't uh, have uh, let's see if I don't knock on wood after I say something like a uh, bad luck will come to me um, or you know like that kind of stuff if I don't throw salt over my shoulder uh, because I spilled it like the demons will come after me and something bad will happen uh, so it's more one's more like superstitious thinking that can lead to like uh, OCD like behavior and the other is just a little bit more um, like that eerie sense of it happening already. Mm -hmm. But they both kind of fall into that like unexplained realm. So it, it, it makes sense. I can see the, the like loose connection. Um, lots of tips about how to improve uh, your memory, kind of last thoughts here. And then I'll talk about uh, the exam a little bit. Uh, your memory has a lot to do with like your lifestyle and your health, 
right? Your, uh, how much sleep you're getting, how motivated you are. Uh, there's a lot of elements that go along with memory. Sadly, there isn't like a magical cure-all, but there are little things that you can do to improve your memory. Um, and so a few of them that are up here, exercise and sleep. Sleep is a big one for memory. Now this is a, a slippery slope because sometimes people will stay up all night cramming for an exam. But if you don't get enough sleep, you're not going to consolidate and hold on to that information. So like it's a, it's a fine line between staying up and cramming versus not getting the sleep that you need for your brain to retain everything. So you want to get good sleep, sleep and exercise, exercise, which increases like um, blood flow and oxygen levels in your brain, or it can help a lot with your remembering as well. Um, having a good diet, keeping your stress in check, giving your brain a workout, like practice seeing memory skills and doing like brain games and brain activities or things that keep your mind active can help as well. Um, being motivated though is probably the biggest one and paying attention. If you don't pay attention the first time, you're not going to remember it. This is my problem every single time when I'm parking. Like I told you, I can never remember where I park. It's because I park my car and then I get out and I'm like, okay, I'm going to whatever I'm doing. Like Disneyland, I park my car and all I can think is like, sure, here I come, right? Like and I didn't even look at what letter and number of like Mickey and friends I'm in. So of course I didn't remember it. Right now I just take a picture, right? Like it's cheating, but uh, I'll just take a picture of it. That way I remember at the end of the day. But if you don't pay attention, it's going to come back to you. Right? You're gonna have a hard time remembering. If you're studying under circumstances where there are a million distractions, it's gonna be hard to focus on what it is that you wanna remember. If you're motivated to remember something, you'll hold on to it. That 28 digit sequence, if you were motivated to, to hold on to it, you probably did. And if you weren't motivated and you didn't practice it or pay attention to it, you probably didn't remember it, right? Unless uh, you were really good at cramming it in at the last moment. Practicing and rehearsing, using as many senses as possible, right? And that's kind of the idea that I shared with you about taking notes that you're listening, seeing it and writing it down. The more senses you can use, the more you can make it meaningful. If you try to explain something in your own words, like you were saying, you were trying to teach it to like a friend, right? This morning, as you were practicing, like that might be a way to see how well you remember something and how well you hold on to it. All of these things kind of add up, but being motivated and paying attention are two of the biggest ones. And then some of the other things like sleep and diet and, and, and all that stuff as well. Oh, there's that. You don't need to hold on to that anyway. <laughs> but I... Uh, I want to take our last few minutes. We don't have a lot of time left, but I want to talk about um, the exam that's on Wednesday. So remember, we talked about this at the beginning. Uh, all of your exams are going to be on Canvas, right? And I really think that will just give you all the best chance at being successful and scoring really highly, um, reducing your anxiety if you were feeling anxious about it. Things are getting more and more like back to, back to normal-ish, but um, just to kind of give you that opportunity to be successful. So what's going to happen is we... You won't have class on Wednesday. Now, you should take that time to take the exam. If you don't want to take it between like 8.30 and 9.45, you have all the way till 11.59 p.m. at night. So what will happen is the exam will open up at like midnight, 12.01 a.m. on Wednesday morning, and it will close at 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday. So you have this time. I'm giving you this time to take it, but if you would rather take it later or earlier, that is completely up to you. But it will close at 11 59 p.m. So please make sure you have finished it by that point, or it will be too late. So you have a whole day to make sure you do it before that deadline. You can use your notes in your book. It'll be the same format as the first test. All right. So you'll take it on that ebook site that you all registered for um, back when you bought the ebook. And it's a uh, you know the same format, 75 minutes to take it. You get the one attempt at it. You can use your notes in your book. But just like before, I would really recommend that you do study and prepare. If you're trying to look everything up, it's going to be tight. Okay, so just make sure that you set yourself up for success. Make sure you have good internet, um, that you have a quiet place. This room, in theory, like should be completely open. Um, and I'll be here, right? So if you want to come and sit in here and take it here, you're more than welcome, though the internet in this room isn't fantastic. Um, there could be another rat that chews through it randomly one day. I don't know. Uh, but... Uh, you will take that on Wednesday, and then you'll have a grade right away. Um, I have to bring them over into Canvas, but you'll get a grade on the ebook site um, after you complete it. So just make sure that you're preparing with the study guide uh, that is on Canvas, right? Or it's also in the back of that ebook um, on the ebook site. You can find it there as well. But make sure that you're preparing. It is on the last chapter since the last test. So it's on uh, 
learning, memory, um, cognition, and then also consciousness. So we're almost there, almost there. Uh, but chapters five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so make sure that you're reviewing those, those chapters. You can use your notes, your book, you can use everything. But um, I would really recommend writing everything on the study guide out. Um, and again, you can come here, you can take it here, you can take it at home, but we won't be meeting in person. I will be here in my office if you have questions or um, if you're here and you want to like, uh, you can meet me, I will be there. So we won't meet in person. So what we'll do is we'll meet the following Monday um, and we'll start with our next unit. So I'll hang out for a few minutes if you have any questions about this, but please uh, don't forget to take it online, take it by the deadline, and I will see you all, uh, see you all next week. Thank you guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.